Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hampton Road South Net Users Group. My name is Kevin Griffin. I'm joined by my co-host, Drew. Drew, how are you today? I'm doing well, and you? I'm hanging in there. It's a, actually a really nice day outside. We're finally gotten over that weather hump, at least here in Virginia, where it's not... It, we'll have like 75 one day and then we would have 30 the next day and it would ebb and flow. It's a kind of a consistent, just nice outside right now, not miserably hot. So if we keep it like this, I'm happy. Wait till this weekend. Oh, don't say that. Man. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Steve Smith. I've known Steve in the MVP.net community for uh, a while now. Um, and this is the first time we've been able to have Steve here at the users group. Um, and, you know, virtual going, you know, COVID has done a lot of good for the user group, I, I think, because it's been able to allow us to bring people in that wouldn't normally be able to come down and uh, speak at the group. So, Steve, we're uh, very happy to have you with us today. Glad to be here. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Um, and anyone out there, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat. Doesn't matter if you're on Twitch, YouTube, or LinkedIn. Um, I'll interrupt Steve when appropriate. Um, and Steve might take breaks in between and look at the chat if there's not a question I get to. Um, but you know, with that, Steve, it's all yours. I'm going to put your screen up on the view. There we go. Cool. All right. It's all yours, sir. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, like, like Kevin said, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, it's because we are all virtual. I can't see you, so I'm just in a room by myself talking to my computer, which is pretty lame. Um, so if you at least ask some questions, that will definitely help it be a little more interactive and let me know that I'm not truly just talking to myself. Um, all right, so tonight we're, we're going to talk about clean architecture uh, and specifically with ASP.NET Core, ASP.NET uh, Core 6 uh, applications. Uh, my name is Steve Smith. I go by Ardalis online because reasons, like uh, Steve Smith being incredibly common. I saw somebody uh, already in the chat was saying they had to figure out which Steve Smith uh, they were they were going to see. Like, yeah, there's there's a few of us. There's actually an International Brotherhood of Steve Smiths Facebook group that I'm a member of um, that's just filled with Steve Smiths. It's pretty sad. So anyway, you'll find me online as Ardalis generally. Uh, you can also hit me up at Nimble Pros, which is my consulting company. Uh, if you need any training or help with uh, architecture and .NET and things like that, we are helping a lot of clients move from classic .NET to .NET Core, or .NET 5 or 6, and, and usually the cloud somewhere in there too. All right, so let me find wherever my PowerPoint controls ended up. There we go. Um, here, here's some resources uh, that might be helpful to you if you're interested after this talk. Um, my plural site course on domain-driven design I did with Julie Lerman. Uh, we've actually done it twice. There's a, an original one from 2014, and then the new one that's all .NET Core. Uh, I think it's done at five, um, came out last year. And it kind of shows this architecture in practice, uh, not one app, but several applications that talk to one another in a distributed architecture. Uh, so it gives you a really good kind of real world-ish uh, insight into how you would set this up in a, in a real application. Um, I have a book uh, that's for free that has been out there for a while now on Microsoft's eShop on Web site. Uh, it's this cover here. I won't read you the title because it's a paragraph long. Um, but it's it's a good overview of some of the principles of how to build applications like this with .NET Core, .NET 6. Uh, I mentioned Nimble Pros, and I also do uh, mentoring on DevBetter for software developers. Um, I have a podcast. I have a newsletter. Uh, the podcast I haven't posted to a lot recently, but the newsletter goes out every Wednesday. Uh, you can sign up at my website, ardellis.com slash tips, and that's it for all the stuff I'm plugging. So since nobody's asked any questions, um, which is typical even in a real world scenario, because who asks questions before they even see the presenter? Um, I am going to start with uh, some questions here to kind of let you know what we're going to be talking about. So the first question that we're, we're going to cover, or, or that you should be able to, to answer when we're done, um, is why do we separate applications into multiple projects? Why do we break up the source code into different projects if we do it all, right? We could just put everything into one uh, web project if we're doing ASP.NET, uh, and, and that would work too, right? So there's there's got to be some reason why we want to break this up. 
Um, and so what are some principles that we can apply when we do organize our software into different modules or different projects? And based on the decisions we make and how we decide to break it up, um, how does that organization of the solution impact coupling? One of the things that is uh, really limiting to the lifespan of applications is the degree of coupling they have, especially to infrastructure, but also to third-party systems and, and other things. Right As the world moves on and your software continues to try and live in it, uh, the more tightly coupled it is to something that the company wants to move away from uh, because they feel like it or out of necessity because something is you know, being deprecated or made obsolete or it's no longer secure or any number of reasons, um, the easier it is for you to decouple from the old thing and replace it with uh, something new, uh, the more likely it is that your software is going to survive for the long term. All right, so thinking about this organization of projects, what are some problems that result from different common approaches? There's one in particular that we're gonna talk about quite a bit. And then how does clean architecture address these problems? And then if you're still using web forms, if you're still using ASP.NET MVC, um, and you haven't yet moved into ASP.NET Core, which I think most people have by now, um, how does ASP.NET Core help all of this? All right, so that's kind of a quick overview of like, this is what you can expect to learn after we're done with this session. Um, I am gonna go through some slides to cover a lot of the, the high level stuff, and then we're gonna dig into the code and basically spend as long as you want, or as long as Kevin will, will stick around, um, kind of looking at the code and answering questions about the code uh, once we get to that point. All right, so I have a, a couple principles here that I wanna talk about before we, we jump into why we wanna organize things the way we do. The first fundamental principle is separation of concerns. And separation of concerns um, is, is one of my favorite principles because it applies very widely in software. Um, a few years ago, uh, my company Nimble Pros made these calendars. Uh, this is one of the images from the calendar. It was a software craftsmanship calendar. And you know we actually set up our refrigerator at the office to, to look like this. Uh, and so the, the basic idea here is you don't want your plumbing code to be mixed in with your user interface code and certainly not with your business logic that is the main thing your application is supposed to do. Um, just like you hopefully don't organize your kitchen uh, this way in, in terms of where you keep your Drano and your toilet plunger uh, versus your stakes, uh, you don't want to organize your code so all that stuff is mixed in either. Uh, we want to put those things where they where they each belong. All right, so with separation of concern, we want to avoid mixing different responsibilities in the same place, whether that's the same method, class, or, or project level. Um, the, the big three that you tend to see most people deal with for separation of concern um, is data access, business rules, and if you're doing domain-driven design or DDD, then we would also talk about your domain model, uh, as well as the user interface. So generally, we want to try and keep at least those three things kind of at arm's length from one another and not uh, intermingle all the code and end up with spaghetti code that mixes all three of those together in the same you know, block of code, okay? So then the next principle that, that kind of goes along with this, and if you follow separation of concerns uh, well, then you'll all automatically be following this one too, and that is the single responsibility principle. And the single responsibility principle basically suggests that we want to avoid tightly coupling our tools together. We want our tools to be fit for purpose and to be able to change them independently from one another. Uh, you could make uh, a Swiss Army mouse like this, like a wired mouse that has all these tools, uh, but it wouldn't be the most useful thing you could do because you know it's not going to be very good at most of those things, and you're going to be limited to like how long your USB cable is in terms of how you can use it. It'd be kind of like if you wanted to have a, a tool that you could use for anything that was like a hammer as well as a screwdriver. Like, yes, you could make that one tool, but it wouldn't work as well for either one if you if you did that. Um, it's better to have things that are fit for purpose and designed to do one task. So with single responsibility in our code, we want to make sure that our classes each focus on one thing that they do. And that means that they only have one reason to change, which also means they're not going to get broken by a change that impacts some other responsibility that some other class is dealing with. Uh, we're seeing this being applied not just at the class level these days, but on larger distributed applications. That's where this whole architectural concept of microservices is coming from, is that we want to be able to deploy units of behavior and then not have to touch them again when we are adding additional behavior somewhere else. Right? We want to be able to have things that are stable and don't break while we make changes to another part of the application or the system. All right. 
Um, then the next one is the don't repeat yourself principle. And the don't repeat yourself principle is one that you've probably heard of as, as dry. Uh, and it's obviously very fundamental to software. That if you follow the don't repeat yourself principle, basically what you'll do is you'll identify repetitive code in different places. Maybe it was copy pasted, or maybe you were just doing the same thing again and again uh, in a few different locations in the code. Um, and you can take those and you can refactor them into functions generally is the first step. Um, and then you can take take those individual functions and group those into cohesive classes. And then typically you organize your classes into folders, namespaces, and eventually even projects um, as a way to just organize your code in a logical fashion. Now, it's worth pointing since I talked about uh, coupling that every time you eliminate duplication, you introduce coupling. All right, so you want to be careful you don't blindly get rid of every bit of repetition in your code base where you might just have some repetition that is coincidental. Like, yes, these two things happen to look the same. They're actually, you know, identical sets of code right now, but they're completely, you know, separate from one another. And that's a good thing because they're going to evolve independently. Um, if we took that code and we put it together into a common function and we had like five different pages that all depended on it, and then one page needs to evolve in a new direction, what do we do? Well, now we probably what a developer is going to do is go into that shared function and add some if logic that says, well, if it's this page, do this. If it's that page, do that. And now instead of having you know simple code in five different places that can evolve independently, you've made it so you have one big complex chunk of code that everything depends on. Um, it's not necessarily an improvement. So be very careful and mindful about when you're eliminating duplication that you're doing it for the right reason. Uh, and it's only truly common code um, that everything should share that you end up doing that with. Now, it's worth thinking sometimes about the software you're working on, other ways that you could group things, other ways that you could organize things. Um, if we were together, I'd say, give me a show of hands. How many of you in your you know, ASP.NET Core or even ASP.NET uh, MVC projects have a folder called controllers or a folder called views or a folder called models, right? All those things that came in the template. Most developers just kind of like do file new project, look at whatever is there and say, OK, and then drive on. And that's the structure. But that's not the only way that we can organize things. Uh, in fact, there's definitely better ways. The, the problem is Microsoft didn't know what you were building. And so they had to put something somewhere. And so they came up with these super generic folder names that aren't really specific to any particular project. Uh, which means they're not really good for any particular project, really. Uh, and so it's it's a good idea for you to, to group things in a, in a way that makes more sense for your application. Some other things you might think about, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on these tonight, um, but just as a as a exercise or as a, another way to look at how you could group things, um, you could group things into aggregates if you're using domain-driven design. Uh, aggregates is a design pattern that lets you group uh, different entities together as as a unit of uh, kind of like a unit of work, but not that pattern. Um, and and then you can group those inside of your your model or inside your business layer. Uh, features is another super common one that's very effective. Um, you can group things into features. Um, a, all the way through all the different projects that you might have. Uh, at the very least, organizing things by feature in the UI project is uh, usually a much better way to go than just having generic top level things like controllers and view models and things like that. Um, and then in domain driven design as well, they have a, a notion of something called a bounded context, uh, which is very useful for keeping things isolated from one another. So your code doesn't get too big and, and complicated um, trying to do all the things in one place. Bounded context and microservices really go hand in hand as well. Ideally, you'll have a one-to-one -one between your bounded context and your microservices. It's not always true. There are certainly exceptions, but it's a it's a general good good way to, to think about it. All right. So now the last principle I want to talk about is the uh, dependency inversion principle. If you've heard of solid, um, the dependency inversion is the D of solid, where single responsibility was the S. And the idea with dependency inversion is to uh, let us eliminate some of that coupling that I'm talking about. You wouldn't want to have your your lamp or your computer or other you know things in your house that need electricity to have to get you know soldered into the wall uh, in order for them to get power, right? It's really convenient that we can just plug things in and unplug them, and as long as you are in the same country, you know generally you're using the same interface for all of your. Uh, electrical outlets, maybe with a three-prong adapter. Well, it turns out that in software, we have these things called interfaces too. We even have a design pattern called adapter, um, and it works exactly like the plugs on your wall do. And it lets you, if you use them, um, plug and play literally uh, your software and the services that it consumes in a much better fashion than if you hard-coded them. Now, what does hard coding them look like in software? Well, that would be if you just newed up the, the concrete implementation that you wanted, right? Anywhere you are newing something up, you're gluing yourself to 
that particular implementation. Uh, I have a blog post I wrote a long time ago called New is Glue. Um, and so every time you new up a class inside your code, you just think in the back of your head, new is glue, right? I'm now glued to that particular instance. Um, and if that's services and, and you know infrastructure dependencies that you're instantiating, consider if there's maybe a better way to do that through the dependency inversion principle. All right, so the idea with dependency inversion is um, that you want to invert the dependency and then inject the thing that you need. That's using dependency injection, which you've probably heard of, uh, which is also known as the strategy design pattern, which you may not realize is the same thing. Um, so in order for this to work, you need to have abstractions. Generally, when you're talking about abstractions in C Sharp and .NET, we're talking about interfaces. Could be something else, could be just a base class, but usually interfaces are more flexible. Um, because you have high level classes that are asking for their dependencies and implementation detail level classes that are implementing those interfaces, we end up with this situation where we have both high level and low level classes depending on these interfaces. That'll be important when we think about how we're gonna organize our software um, because of the direction of that dependency. All right, then uh, related principle here is the explicit dependencies principle. It's not nearly as well known as the solid principles, um, but I like to use this for all the services and, and other things that I'm gonna instantiate inside my project. The explicit dependencies principle basically says that your services should request all of their dependencies through their constructor. And what this does is it eliminates hidden dependencies. It makes it so your types are honest about what they need and not deceptive. Um, it's very frustrating for me when I'm working in a code base and I need to do X and I quickly, you know, scan the, the code and see, is there already something that does that? Oh yeah, there's a service. It's got X. Okay. Well, I can just hit it up in IntelliSense and see, oh, there's this service that says do X uh, and, and its constructor doesn't need anything. Perfect. So I can just new that up and call it uh, and go home early because I didn't have to write that code. Somebody else already did it. Well, then when you go to run it, what happens? Well, at runtime, it says, oh, I need this config value. Oh, I need to access this file. Oh, I need a connection string to Azure Blob Storage, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, depending on what it is, it's probably got some dependencies in there that you didn't know about. They're not in the constructor. So short of you looking through every line of code or maybe scanning the using statements and hope that, you know, those give you a clue, there's no way for you to know what dependencies something actually has unless you are requesting them in your constructor. And it's a bonus that when you follow this principle, it makes it really easy for you to unit test these classes because all of the things that they need are in their constructor. So in your unit test, you can create them and you can pass in real versions or you could pass in fake versions or mocks or whatever you want. Um, it makes it really easy to isolate these services from one another so that you can test them. Okay. So we've talked about where these interfaces uh, are used. And so that means if they're going to be accessible by low-level services as well as high-level services um, and the, the user interface entry point needs to be able to, to wire these things up, that means they've got to be accessible basically from everywhere in the application. Um, and so that's going to inform where we want to put our interfaces and our abstractions in our final solution design. But before we jump to that, let's talk about one more quick thing with how interfaces help our design. And that is the difference between compile time references and dependencies and runtime uh, execution flow. So in a typical application that doesn't use abstraction at all and literally just instantiates each class it needs, you could imagine that class A, like maybe your main program, you know, instantiates some service, class B, which then instantiates some class C and, and calls some method on it. Right? And so at compile time, obviously C Sharp needs to know about that class that you're instantiating and that method you're calling. And so everything is wired up uh, and strongly typed at compile time. And then at runtime, the control flow is the, exactly the same. Right, It's the exact same diagram. Um, if you set a breakpoint in class C and look at the call stack, you'll see it's class A called class B called class C. All right. But if we use abstraction, we can make it look like this. So with abstraction, we can say that class A uh, references interface B uh, and has no knowledge at all about some class B. Uh, and class B, in turn, can you know, use interface C. Uh, and so the uh, execution at runtime can just be some flexible you know, wiring up of these different implementations. Even though at compile time, there is no knowledge um, from class A to the things it's ultimately going to work with. Right? The interfaces are allowing you to break that coupling. And they're super cheap. 
right? Anyone that goes and tells you, oh, we don't want to use interfaces, all that abstraction, that's, that's a waste of time. It's too much work. Like, really? Have you seen an interface? Right? It's like four lines of code. It's, it's really not hard. And it's all built into .NET Core now, right? All the DI stuff is just there. It's, it's how the whole system works. So there's, there's not a whole lot of anything extra you've got to do to make this work. Okay, so one of the fundamental things you should do if you're designing your solution is you want to make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard. So you force developers into the pit of success. And if you're building things in such a way that the easy way of doing something tends to be the wrong thing, then you're going to end up with all your developers in the pit of despair, which is not nearly as nice. All right, so when we're trying to make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard, one of the things we want to do is make sure that the UI classes don't directly depend on infrastructure classes like data access, file access, cloud access, whatever. So, you know, how do we structure the solution so that we can enforce that? Um, similarly, our business and domain classes shouldn't depend on infrastructure stuff. So how could your solution enforce that as well? Um, and then lastly, we want to make that repetition that we're trying to avoid uh, easier for us to apply than copy paste. Right? We want to find ways to implement cross-cutting concerns in a way that doesn't involve copy-pasting code from one place to another. All right, and I think I've got some questions. So let me take a quick sip of water. And Kevin, you want to tell me what we've got? Kevin, you're muted. Kevin, you're still muted. Oh, it would help if I unmuted my mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I'm all right. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on resolvers? So, classes or objects that have access to the DI container, but don't aren't necessarily um, uh, things aren't being injected directly. They're being resolved at runtime. Usually, you want to avoid those in most places. They might have a place in factories. They might have a place if you're writing framework code. Um, it sounds like that is describing kind of the service locator pattern, which is yeah. generally considered to be an anti-pattern, although there are exceptions. Um, so, you know, the reason why you don't want to have that direct access comes down to coupling and testability in my mind, right? If I have some block of code and inside of there, it reaches out to the dependency resolver directly or, or you know, usually through some static uh, approach and then, you know, says, hey, get me required service, so this class instance, um, and, then, and then call it. Well, now to unit test that, I have to wire up a DI container and then configure it with proper services that it needs just for that one test. And then maybe another test needs a different set of services or whatever. Um, whereas if it was just coming in from the constructor using the explicit dependencies principle, it's way easier for me. I just knew it up and pass it what it needs, right? I don't have to do all this extra, you know, infrastructure work just to unit test. Uh, and I think that's all we have question wise. So cool. All right. So you're good. I think that was Nick the first one. So Nick, if you had any follow up on that, you know, like where exactly you want to use resolvers that, you know, is going to make it easier or better for you than if you were to just use uh, constructor dependency injection, let me know. Um, and real quick, I should also say um, there's a reason why I prefer constructor dependency injection, and that is that it forces the object to be in a valid state from the moment that you create it. Right? There are other ways that you can do dependency injection. There's property-based injection, um, where you have a, a property that represents this class that you need or the service instance that you need, uh, and you rely on the consumer to set that property at some point. Right? But what if they don't? Right. If they don't, well, then you're just in an inconsistent state and you'll just blow up with an all reference or something when, when someone tries to use you. Uh, so it's not nearly as discoverable. Uh, this comes back to that pit of success thing. If you force them all through the constructor, there is no way for them to do it wrong. Right. There's, there, they can't they can't forget. Right. Um, and then the other one is method based. And I do use that sometimes. Um, the problem with method based uh, dependency injection is that it doesn't have any tooling support. So all you're really doing is kicking the can up the road. And now whatever is calling you needs to request in its constructor the dependency so it can pass it to the method. Um, and if you do enough of that, it gets really nasty and your all the consumer constructors get really big uh, for no really good reason other than just pass them along to the to the method. All right. More from Nick. Yeah, he's saying uh, they use it in um, more in a factory or similar types. They cycle dependencies uh, in runtime based on different forms, and it's wrapper. It's a wrapper around DI container, so I lifetime scope, and 
with sorry and with interface injected it can be mocked in tests so seems like he's as a slightly more complicated yeah. setup. using it using it in a factory and also the fact it sounds like he's uh allowing it to change dependencies at runtime uh and not restarting the app which is typically what you would do with with a web app um it sounds like that might be a perfectly reasonable place to do what he's doing. And if he's already solved the testability problem, then I'd say that's great. You know, yeah. if it's working for you, I'm, I'm not going to tell you it's wrong. Um, so yeah, that, that seems fine. Um, I would, I would exercise caution in general, uh, doing that, that resolver access and the, uh, you know, direct access to the IOC container from anywhere in your code. Um, but there are certain places where it makes sense. So. And especially if you're trying to do, you know, real-time changes, you know, you need to get access to the container somehow so you can do that, I would guess. All right, I see some further discussion going on with other people there, but I'll let them have at that, uh, and we'll, we'll keep driving on here. Okay, so right. we're going to jump to uh, another type of architecture, and this is one that many of you are familiar with. This is called uh, N-tier architecture or, or classic N-tier, uh, sometimes called N-layer. Um, and this has been around for over two decades. Uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, old school way of, of organizing things. It was the de facto standard way of organizing things for web forms, applications, and VB6 for that matter too. Most, most client server type .NET or, or Microsoft apps um, from like the late 90s until about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, um, we're, we're using this pattern. And many of them have lived on, uh, and, and I'm sure people are building new apps that use this pattern today. Right here's a, a screenshot. This is from Microsoft's old MSDN website, the Microsoft Developer Network uh, that they don't have anymore, um, from around 2001. And I actually included this exact image in my very first conference talk in 2001, um, which which sadly was about two weeks after the 9/11 attacks in uh, September of 2001. And so my my conference talk. Uh, had very few people in it because nobody wanted to get on an airplane at that time. So I remember uh, very distinctly, I had six people in the room. So this is a bigger talk than, than that was. Um, but it was on this. It was on like, you should move from having everything inside of one you know, VB6 form or one ASP page um, and break it up into these different layers. And it had a lot of benefits, right? You know, if you had everything together, you know, you had this spaghetti code where all the stuff was in one place and it made it really difficult to maintain. It made it really hard to expand the team um, and be able to have multiple people working on something big and complicated at the same time, which kind of limited your velocity. Uh, and so there were good reasons why you would have a data access layer as a separate thing and a business layer as a separate thing. Um, but the big problem with this that, that we weren't using very much at that time was it didn't have any abstractions. Um, and so what it meant was that, you know, obviously the data layer uh, is going to have a, a dependency on the database here. Um, and each one of these other projects depends on the next layer below it. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, you want to avoid sort of end run uh, where the UI layer like directly talks to the data access layer or directly calls the database. Um, and so each one would call through the layer below it. That was by design. Um, but all these dependencies are transitive. So since the data access layer depends on the database, that means the business layer does too, and the UI layer does too. And if you go in and you say, hey, I want to do some of that automated testing I've heard so many good things about, it is a real pain um, because everything depends on the database. And I've been there. I've spent a lot of time trying to test apps that were built this way, some of which I built this way, uh, and, and it just sucks the life out of you. It is, it is not fun. Right? And if any of you are uh, not a big fan of testing, um, ask yourself if it's because you had to test something that was just this painful to test. Um, that might be why. Uh, if you find yourself testing stuff that is properly architected and is testable, it's actually kind of fun. Uh, and you can you know, go through it quickly and not feel like you're, you're trudging through mud. Um, and so that brings us to this domain-centric design, which is uh, a much better way to organize your code from a dependency management standpoint. And so, Domain-centric design uh, is, is one thing that I call it that, that is related to clean architecture. Um, it involves taking the domain model or the business layer or the business rules uh, and putting it at the center of, of everything, of the whole app. Um, and so inside there, it's not going to be just business logic. But if you're following you know, sort of domain-driven design principles, it's going to be a model of the problem space that you're trying to solve. It's going to have abstractions and entities and services um, that have to do with that problem space. 
Now, the interfaces that you define here are going to be written uh, in the context of these domain entities and types, right? So that means that the, the return types from the interfaces should be these, these business objects uh, and their parameters generally should be these business objects or, you know, they should be, you know, just built in types like lists or generic collections or, um, you know, ints and date times and strings. What they shouldn't be is a DB context or a SQL data reader or a, an Azure blob storage service, right? They shouldn't be infrastructure specific um, things. They should be generic and, and at a higher level of abstraction. It's just your, uh, your business model, okay? And then everything else in the application, including all that low level plumbing code, depends on these interfaces and these domain objects. So this is where we invert that dependency. We say, instead of having the business layer depend on the data access layer, um, we're gonna have the data access layer depend on the business layer, right? We're gonna flip it. Um, and so that's what the heart of clean architecture is really about. Um, it's very similar to onion architecture, which Jeffrey Palermo made popular in a series of blog posts about 12 years ago. Uh, hexagonal architecture predates that, uh, and ports and adapters even predates that. Uh, and so there's, it goes by many different names, but they all follow the same basic principles. Here's an example of onion architecture, where in the middle, you've got these domain entities that you access with these repository interfaces, and you call things through service interfaces, perhaps. Uh, sometimes there's an application layer involved with those services. Services. Um, and then around the outside in the purple layer, that's where everything else is. That's where all your test projects are. That's where your UI projects are. Um, everything else is, is outside, depending inward on the domain model. Looking at ports and adapters, um, this is a diagram for that. You can see in the middle, you've got this domain layer. Again, there's an optional application layer that the application works through. Uh, and these little purple circles that they call ports, those are the interfaces, right? Those are the interfaces that you expose that then other classes are going to implement as adapters or uh, providers, if you like. Uh, and so an internal persistence port that says how I'm gonna save and retrieve uh, the business types from the, a data store uh, might be satisfied with an in-memory implementation here in the top right, uh, or you could have a remote database, or sorry, relational database uh, system like SQL Server or Oracle or whatever uh, as another way. Uh, and you can swap them out, right? So at runtime, you can pick which one of these to plug in um, and your system doesn't care. You know, the domain layer doesn't even know what types there, there are of those. It only knows about the abstractions and the ports that it exposes. Um, so this becomes a very, very flexible way to structure your application, and it lets you plug in different implementations for how you want to work with other systems. It's also extremely testable. All right. Um, are there any questions coming in that I should jump on? I see a lot of stuff going on in the chat. Uh, there's a little bit of chatter about uh, different things. Um, all right. Here was a question. Uh, what about when your constructor have the same services like iLogger, iMediator, iMapper? Would you not wire this up to a DI property injection or would you still do it through a constructor? That is an excellent question. Um, and my answer is, uh, remember, I'm a consultant. It depends. And uh, the reason why it depends in this case is whether or not I'm the one that's going to be creating these services or if the framework is going to create them. If the framework is going to create them and I'm never going to, then I am okay to, to make an exception to the rule and use property injection. So specifically when I'm using uh, controllers, and I'll show an example of this at the end of this uh, presentation, um, it's, if I'm using mediator with controllers, I will make that a property on a base controller. Um, and then it's available for every controller. Um, I don't actually use that pattern anymore because I found a better one. Um, but when I was doing that, that's, that's what I did. And the reason for that is I never, ever, ever knew up a controller, right? There is a, a you know, service inside of ASP.NET or ASP.NET Core that is responsible for creating controllers. And it does that and it uses the DI container and makes sure that it satisfies that property every time. So there's never a case where someone's going to new up a controller and forget to set the, the mediator property. Right? It just doesn't happen. Um, and when I test the controllers, I do test them, but I don't test them with unit tests. I don't new them up. Right? I use the functional tests that are part of ASP.NET Core, where you can use the test server and the web application factory and, and all that good stuff. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, what else? Uh, the rest of it was just discussion around that cool. question. Perfect. All right, then let's keep going. Let's talk about the rules for clean architecture, which I'm currently violating the first rule, which is that you don't talk about clean architecture. Um, sorry, that's not actually the rule. That, that, that movie is so old. Who would make a joke about that now? Um, let's talk about the actual rules, which the first one is uh, the application core contains the domain model. 
So what does that mean? That means all your business stuff, all your business logic, all your representations of business state, they live inside the core uh, library, the core project, right? They don't get scattered anywhere else. You don't have them leaking into the infrastructure project, the web project, or in the database. Um, there could be representation of the state in the database, but the logic should live inside this, this domain model. Um, you want to have all your projects depend on the core project. All the dependencies point inward if you're using the, the you know, concentric circles representation. Um, if you're using the, the classic you know, stacked layers uh, for, for your you know, dependencies, then you know, if, if the core project is at the bottom, everything else is pointing down to it. We'll see some diagrams with that in a minute. Um, you want to make sure that your inner projects are defining the interfaces and the outer projects are the ones implementing them. Um, interface can always be either in a... a uh, for lower lower level, that's not what I want, uh, closer to the center um, project or in the same project. Right? It just won't compile the other way. If you try and define an interface in, let's say, the web project, and then you want to implement that in the core project, it just won't work because the project references won't let you do that. And then uh, you should avoid direct dependency on the infrastructure project. The infrastructure project is what I call the project where I put all my infrastructure implementation code, right? So it has data access and email sending and file access and cloud access. All that stuff that talks to other things that aren't my program lives inside that infrastructure project. And I don't want to directly depend on that from um, the, the uh, other parts of the application, like any of it. OK, so then let's talk about some of the benefits of clean architecture, some of the features that it has. Um, it is framework independent, right? So these hexagonal and ports and adapters things, those weren't Microsoft people and .NET people coming up with those. Those are patterns from you know, Java and, and from other disciplines. Um, they've been around for a while. This is a cross-cutting uh, way of organizing code. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you're using .NET or not, you can still apply these architectural principles to any, any language. Um, it also is obviously database independent. If you follow the clean architecture approach, you are going to write code that 99% of the application doesn't even know if there is a database, not much less you know what which specific database it is. Um, and that is incredibly liberating for how you're going to write your C-sharp code, because you're not locked into a particular database or relying on that store procedure or this trigger or some other database-specific functionality. Right? All the stuff you care about and need is at your fingertips inside your C-sharp code, uh, which is really nice. It's also UI independent. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the context of ASP.NET Core, but um, it doesn't really care, right? You can use clean architecture in uh, any any number of different front ends. And like I've harped on a little bit, you might uh, understand that I'm a big fan of testability, mostly because I, I, I hate inefficiency. Uh, and I don't want to have to test the same thing manually over and over again or pay somebody else to do that when computers do that really well. Um, and so I'd much rather let computers do what they do well so that I, I'm freed up to do things that, that a computer can't do. OK, so let's say that you are curious or even convinced that clean architecture is worth a shot, but you already have an application and it wasn't necessarily built using clean architecture. What can you do? What if you want to refactor to it? Um, obviously, the easiest way to start is from the beginning. So if you are starting brand new with a project you haven't even begun yet, um, or if you're already, you know, have someone has decided that a rewrite is the right way to go, Usually it's, it, it, well, sometimes it's right, but a lot of times it's not. Um, you know, in any case, you can start from this template. So we're going to take a look at this template. Uh, it basically has everything laid out for you how you need it. Uh, it's a good starting point for you. And your next best is that you already have an application and it's all in a single project. The reason why this is nice is because you don't have to worry about inverting any dependency directionality, right? Everything is in the same place. Everything can get to each other. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to, to pull out the bits that need to go where um, inside of the, the clean architecture structure uh, and get it all to work correctly with, without too much effort, right? It'll take amount of time based on how big the project is, uh, but it won't be as painful as the last option, which is you already have a big existing investment in an architecture that is organized in an N tier structure, which is to say, the wrong way, uh, and you have a whole lot of dependencies going from the user interface to the business layer to the data layer, and now we've got to flip a lot of that stuff. Um, that's going to be a much heavier lift. Uh, and if you're not confident in your ability to, to take that on, it might be worth bringing someone in that, that does that kind of thing uh, or has some experience that at least gets you started on the right road, uh, and then you know, you'll be good from there. So. Those are, those are my ideas on, on this. Um, it's, it's easy, low-hanging fruit if you're starting with something new. It can be harder if you have a big system that's not following these, these principles. Okay, 
Um, let's talk about what goes where a little bit more deeply, right? So you're gonna have this core project at the center of the application. The core project is just a class library uh, and it's gonna have a bunch of classes in it that don't have any knowledge of you know the platform that you're running on, you know, it's going to be .NET, but you know they don't they don't know uh, even if you're on Windows, right? And they don't know if you're talking to SQL Server or not. They don't know if you're in Azure or Amazon. Um, they, they should be agnostic to all those decisions. It's just code, right? So in here, there's going to be your interfaces that we talked about. There's going to be your domain model, which is going to be consisting of entities, typically at a minimum. Um, you might also use value objects. You might also use aggregates. These are DDD patterns that can be very useful in breaking up your uh, complexity in your system. You might have some services, that's pretty common. If you're using entities, you want to try and put behavior with the entities if you can. Uh, if you start going down the path of writing a lot of services here, uh, it can end up with your entities not having very much behavior at all and having to expose all their state uh, because they have to share it to the services to be able to do the work. Um, so be careful of that. If you find yourself writing most of your logic in services and not in your entities, um, that's usually a, a sign that you're, you have some design issues to, to think about. Um, I'm a big fan of custom domain exceptions. So those would go in your domain model as well. A domain exception is something that just should never possibly happen in your in your abstraction of, of the problem space. Um, for instance, maybe you are saying, uh, I've got an e-commerce system and the user can check out, but they should never ever uh, check out when they have a, a cart that's empty. Right, so on the cart.checkout method, right, there's some exception that throws that says, you know, cart empty exception. Um, now, why would you want that to be an exception? Because you have a premise in your code that there is no way ever in any pathway in your code that that method should ever be called with an empty cart, right? And if it is, that's a bug. Uh, and you should be able to find that bug very quickly as soon as you see that exception. Um, and the other place where these are nice is where you know that something is going to end up being a null reference exception. So instead of just letting the null reference exception bubble up, create your own custom exception and throw that instead. Uh, it's so much easier to find a you know, customer required exception than a null reference exception because customer was null. Um, and then you've got to figure out like, well, what was null, right? You know, null reference exception is classically excellent at telling you exactly the thing that's null, right? No, not so much. Um, and so it's much, much better if you've got something that kind of tells you exactly what the problem is. Uh, all right, another thing that would go inside your core project would be domain events um, and their handlers. Their handlers could be in other projects too, but there's, there's frequently some inside the core project. What are domain events? Well, they're another thing that you can learn about in the context of domain-driven design. They're a standalone pattern as well. Um, they make it really easy for you to avoid your code getting really big uh, in certain parts of the application where a lot of stuff happens or, or something triggers a lot of things happening. Um, and so they, they are really nice for kind of breaking up that code and making your code easier to test and, and easier to work with. So I'm a big fan. Uh, I teach about them quite a bit uh, and they're built into this clean architecture template that I'm showing you. All right, then also specifications, another DDD pattern that you may be familiar with or not. It's one of the least popular uh, DDD patterns, but what specifications let you do is avoid duplication and avoid having you know your data access logic sp spread out like spaghetti all over your code. So if currently you're using like direct access to DB context or you're using iQueryable and anywhere in your application, whether it's in a controller or a view or a razor page or a service, you decide that you want to get you know the list of something, but where this and dot select that, right? And you're modifying the the exact you know, shape of the data you want. What you're doing is you're putting query logic everywhere in your code, um, which means that it's really hard to, to find it all in one place, change it in one place, implement rules like caching in one place. Um, it's making it so it's much more difficult for you to separate concerns. How you're going to query the data is a concern. Um, specifications encapsulate that specifically. And so anywhere in your code where you want to say what the shape of the data should be, instead of just putting a bunch of link goo in there, you would instantiate the appropriate specification, and then it has that logic in it. Uh, and so these work really well for cleaning up that type of stuff. All right. Next, let's talk about the infrastructure project. Um, infrastructure project, again, is where everything that is out of process, that's not your code, um, all the things that talk to those other things should live here. So this is going to be repositories for data access. Um, your actual data access, whether it's Dapper or a DB context or whatever it might be, you know, SQL data readers, um, all that stuff should live in the infrastructure project. If you want to use caching around your data access, which I strongly recommend you consider, especially for stuff that's always the same, like your lookup tables, um, you would put your cache repositories in here as well. 
Um, the reason why I have a separate cache repository and I don't just put that logic in the repository is again, separation of concerns, single responsibility principle. It's really easy to use a pattern called the decorator pattern to add caching behavior to any particular uh, query that you want, um, as opposed to having to go and edit the actual code inside that query, which could break it, right? So the decorator is another pattern that I, I strongly encourage you to, to check out. All right, your web API clients would go here. So let's say you need to talk to the GitHub API, the Netflix API, the you know whatever third-party API, you're gonna send emails with SendGrid through their API. Your, your API clients need to live here um, that, that talk to those things. These are your adapters that, that talk to those third-party APIs. Um, any file system accessors, any logger adapters that talk to real things um, should go here. Also, your email sending, SMS sending would all be here. The system clock abstraction would be here if you need one. Um, and so, you know, in your code, if you have logic that depends on what time of day is it or what day of the week is it, um, that code ideally should not be depending on datetime.now. Because that means if you try to write a test for it and it says, well, here's this test that says, you know, during the day, I'm going to send you a text, but at night, I'll just send you an email, right? Well, I could write a test that says, you know, from nine to five, it uh, sends a text, and then I can run that test between nine and five, and it works. But then at 5.01 p.m., the test fails um, because it doesn't do the right thing that I expected. Uh, so it's, you know, obviously not the great greatest test if it only works some time of the day. Uh, and so if you pass in some, you know, date time abstraction, then you can write a test that's, uh, you know, fakes out what time it is instead of having to, you know, rely on the actual clock on the box. Uh, it's a much better way to go. Okay, and then other services would go here along with uh, possibly interfaces. And so these interfaces and services belong here if the signature of the interface and the corresponding service uh, is depending on these infrastructure things, right? So if you have something that, you know, returns a, uh, I don't know, Azure blob storage something uh, as, as the return type on this service, that can't go in the core project because it would then couple the core project to Azure but it can certainly go in the infrastructure project and the service that implements it would go there as well. All right, any questions here? I see a bunch of good chat happening, at least on, on Twitch. There was a discussion about uh, exceptions. Um, I, I'm not sure if the question still stands, but it was... Um, I see someone saying that they should be truly exceptional, which, which is what I would agree with. Um, would you use exceptions or just try to find other ways to enforce logic? Um, I think the chat was kind of getting to, uh, you know, exceptions are your worst case scenario. If you can do other validation to um, return a, an error result or something, do that before you eventually get to the exception. But, you know, throw the exception if it's the worst case scenario. Yeah, you use exceptions for things that should never happen in your code. Um, so like, you know, if you have a dependency, like this service only works if you pass it in these other services, um, you know, if it's all being done by DI, like if it's in a controller, you might not even have to check it, right? Cause you know, the DI is going to say, Hey, I, I can't even create the controller. I don't have this service. Um, but if it's a service that you might create yourself somewhere, then it, it is pretty common to use guard clauses, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, to make sure that those things are not null. Uh, you might also use guard clauses for other things like making sure input is in an expected range or, you know, looks like the right thing. An email address needs to not be, you know, empty or, or something like that. Um, Validation and exceptions go, you know, sort of hand in hand. And there's, um, you know, there's there's reasons why you might or might not want to use exceptions. Uh, if at the end of the day you're going to return back some kind of an error code to the user, like a bad request, then it doesn't really matter if you used an exception or not, right? The, the you're not going to process their actual request, uh, and so there might be a you know marginal benefit uh, in terms of. Uh, performance on the server uh, to, to returning a code versus actually throwing an exception. But the idea is that the code is failing um, because it's it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and so if you could fix it, then, then avoid the whole exception thing, right? If you can take the data, realize it's not quite right, and then put it into a format that you can accept and drive on, then that's that's fine. Don't don't throw an exception. You can you can handle it. Um, but if the at the end result is that the, the program execution needs to stop, there's either a bug in your software or the or their client has given you invalid input. Um, in either one of those cases, an exception is usually the right thing to do. Um, and you generally shouldn't have too many of those relative to the happy path in your code. 
right? Like most of the API calls that your SPA is sending should be correct because the SPA should be making sure that the stuff is all valid on the client. And so the only people that should be getting these bad requests uh, generally should be people that are, you know, hammering at you on Postman trying to break stuff, um, not your regular users that are, you know, going through the, the UI that you've handcrafted to be, you know, putting them on, on the rails. I think that's all we have at the moment. All right, uh, cool. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about exceptions. So. Good. It's a good all topic. All right. I think we're good. All right. So that was the infrastructure project. There's one more, which is the web project. And so this is your ASP.NET Core web project that you all know and love. Uh, in here, you're going to have all the, the web stuff that talks to, to the user. That might be controllers and views. That might be razor pages. That might be APIs, uh, whatever that is. Uh, then you're going to have your DTOs, your data transfer objects. These are the things that all those things work with. So these are view models or API models or binding models. They, they tend to call them models, but they're basically just DTOs, right? They're just data that we're going to bind to uh, or serialize to JSON and send over the wire. Um, and so all those things belong in here as well, because the things that they're being used with, the API endpoints or the views or the razor pages, they all live here too. Uh, and they're very much you know, web concerns. Uh, they're not something that belongs in your domain model. Your domain model doesn't care what the specific set of uh, DTOs are for you know that razor page or, or that view that you're going to uh, bind to. Um, all the other ASP.NET Core things that you might customize or have your own version of, like filters, like binders, like tag helpers or HTML helpers, those things all live here too. Right? Everything that depends on ASP.NET Core should generally live in the web project unless you're sharing it. And we'll talk about sharing it between projects in a second. Um, but at least like the first time when we build one, a single application, this is where that stuff would go. It wouldn't go in infrastructure necessarily. Um, it could, but you know, there's no reason for it. It's easier to have it in the web project. Uh, and that's where most developers are gonna expect to find it. Uh, and it wouldn't go in core because that would couple core to ASP.NET. Um, and so you, you don't want that either. Uh, and likewise, you might have other services and interfaces in here. I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Uh, again, this is all driven by the types that are used by those services or interfaces. Um, so if you have a service that returns back a view model or an API model as the thing it returns, well, then it has to live here at this level um, because the types that it's consuming are at this level. Uh, and so you couldn't put it in, say, the core project because the types are in the web project uh, and it won't compile that way. Okay. Um, all right. So then uh, I see a question about Automapper. Uh, Automapper, I, I'm a fan of uh, when it makes sense. Uh, I, I don't use it all the time. Uh, it can bite you. Uh, so just be aware that Automapper, uh, if, you change, if you change the model, Automapper might do stuff automatically and, and not blow up and not tell you um, that, you know, you added something on one side, but not the other. Uh, and it just drives on and you, know, you might not find that for a while unless you have a lot of good unit tests. Uh, so just be aware of that. If you do everything yourself, uh, you're much less likely to miss something when, when the model changes. Um, so with, with that caution in mind, I think Automapper can be a great tool. Uh, and if you do find that you, know, you have a fairly simple CRUD application and you're following good practice of not exposing your entities directly over the API, um, which you absolutely should never do, then Automapper can save you some boring code of, of taking your customer entity and turning it into a customer DTO that looks really similar, uh, but isn't the same exact type. All right. Okay. Um, now, what if you have multiple solutions? Your organization doesn't just have one web application. They have a bunch, or at least two, uh, and you want to share some things between those projects. There is a term in domain-driven design called the shared kernel, and the shared kernel is a, a place where bounded contexts overlap. Uh, and so what goes in the shared kernel generally are things that the core projects can depend on. So that means the shared kernel should not itself have any relationship, any uh, dependency or coupling uh, to infrastructure concerns. All that stuff that I, I said we want to keep at a distance from our core, we also want to keep out of the shared kernel if, if possible. Uh, so things that go here are usually like base classes. Uh, things like base entities, domain events, base specification, maybe some common exceptions that your company has. Uh, you know, everybody in the company uses this, you know, shared user account or whatever. And so there are certain exceptions that the user account wasn't valid or the user account was expired or whatever, right? Those could all go here so that every application could have a consistent way of dealing with user account uh, exceptions or whatever. Um, common interfaces could go here. Uh, 
common authentication, DI, logging, guard clauses, all that stuff could go uh, in the shared kernel. Now, you don't want to put stuff in the shared kernel that will break other applications. So if your team would like to have this thing that you know they want to put in shared kernel, but um, other, other teams are also using that shared uh, package, and they would be broken by that, and they don't want to change to, to accommodate it, um, then it shouldn't go in there, right? It should have buy-in from all the stakeholders, all the consumers of the, of the shared kernel package should have a veto power over what goes in there. So it should only be stuff that everybody agrees uh, is stuff they want there and it's stuff they would use that would end up here. The other thing is, ideally, you want to use the NuGet package to share this, right? There's a lot of ways to share code in .NET. You can copy paste it. You can share it by just adding the same project to multiple different solutions. Uh, you can even do stuff where you have different repositories and you you know pull in uh, and by repository I mean Git repository, right? And so you have a, a linked Git repository that has the shared code that you pull in, All right? Don't do any of those. Use NuGet. Uh, the reason why you want to use NuGet instead of sharing the files directly um, is because then and if you know you have multiple teams shipping multiple apps at whatever cadence they want, and they're independent from one another, which is all stuff that should sound very good to you if you're looking into microservices, because that's how microservices should be, right? You want to be able to say, hey, we all agreed we're going to add this change to shared kernel. Um, and oh, by the way, it's changing a method signature. It's going to break that method signature. Um, and so team decides that they need that for them to go live. So they make the change in the shared kernel, and then they go live, right? And because they're using NuGet, they can version it. So maybe version one is what everybody was using. Um, and now team alpha is using you know, version two and they ship and they're good and their stuff works in production. All the other teams code still works in production because they haven't deployed anything, but they had something they were about to deploy too. So team Bravo goes and deploys five minutes later and they didn't take in that change because they're still on version one. And you know this didn't have to delay them at all. So they still ship and they're still fine. And they can revise up to version two whenever they feel like it, right? Just like you do with all your other NuGet packages. You aren't forced to take in every change immediately. Uh, and that flexibility really helps when you have multiple teams building multiple products in the same org. All right. Back to uh, guard clauses again. Uh, if anyone is not familiar with guard clauses, here's what you don't want to do. Um, when you're doing any kind of validation of inputs at the method level, and you're checking to make sure that they're not null or things like that, null is the, the most common one. Um, there's a new feature coming in C-sharp 11, probably, uh, that's proposed where they're just going to add exclamation points to the variable name here. So this will be custom, customer. Uh, that's that's interesting. I should probably say customer. Um, customer, customer, uh, bang, bang, uh, where bang is exclamation point. Um, that will automatically throw a, a null reference exception if that thing is null. We don't have that yet. So here's, here's some pretty common looking code for this. Now, there's only two uh, arguments coming into this particular method. Um, you can imagine if there were five or six that there would be a lot more nesting in here. And, and this little comment right here, this is we're going to process the order, that kind of gets lost in the noise of all this other cruft. All right, and your cyclomatic complexity goes through the roof because you have all these different uh, else statements and things. So a better way to do this, what, what is the guard clause pattern, is just to fail fast, right? Do the check for the thing um, first, and if it fails, then you're done, right? Throw, you're, you're out of there. Um, and then once you've made it past the gauntlet of checks, then you just have the, the happy path is all that's left, right? There's no else clauses. Uh, I'm generally not a big fan of else clauses. So if I can find a way to avoid having an else by instead exiting, um, I will do that every time, right? It tends to make much simpler, much shorter code that doesn't get indented nearly as far. Um, so, so those are what you would use guard clauses for. Now, even this uh, is pretty repetitive code, right? And, and there's about five different ways that you can throw an argument null exception right now, and that's before we add the bang bang syntax that's coming. So what do you do if there's five different competing standards for something? You introduce another standard. And so I have a NuGet package that is uh, guard clauses, and you can use this for a bunch of different things, not just null checks. You can even use your own custom ones. Um, and all of them then will just look like this. You can say guard, dot, against, dot, and then there's a list of things you might guard against, and then you just pass it in like this. And so it makes it much more consistent, in my opinion, um, than having every developer do it possibly a different way. Uh, and so you can try that if you want. It's a, it's a popular NuGet package. It's got like 3 million downloads. Um, not nearly as popular as like AutoMapper, but you know it's, it's, been, it's been used by a few people. Um, so you can check that out if you find that uh, worthwhile. OK, so here's where we're at. Go quick ahead, quick uh, yeah. intervention. Uh, someone was asking. Um, there are actually two separate questions. One was, would you uh, use a customer required exception 
instead of a argument null exception here. Right. For this one, because I mentioned having like uh, yeah. special custom things. Um, this this one would probably be fine because I'm the one throwing the exception. Um, if inside a process order I wasn't doing the check at all, and you know it was possible that somewhere inside of process order it was just going to null ref on customer when I tried to access it, um, then then I might you know throw throw that. I don't know. I'm torn. Um, I, I could see it being either way. Uh, I definitely do just the the standard guard clause when it's a constructor and it's a necessary uh, requirement or dependency for this class to work. Mm -hmm. um, inside of something like process order, where it's obviously a business class, uh, you know, I, I threw this together just a, as a stupid example to use in my powerpoints, and I've been using it for a while now. But you're making me think. Like maybe yeah. this should be a a business level exception, not just a null ref uh, or an argument null in this case. Well, that's the thing. Argument null is still better than null ref. Argument null at least yeah. tells me what's null, right? And that's the main thing that I want to get. So this is not as bad as a null ref uh, because it tells me which thing is null. Uh, I could see making that a customer required exception possibly, but it, it wouldn't be something I would, I would immediately jump to in this case. Uh, and there's also a question, uh, you're talking about guard clauses are basically preconditions for right. a method. Uh, are there examples of post uh, post conditions? I mean, there are different software, uh, like design by contract uh, techniques where, where folks have done that. Um, I don't typically do that in, in my code. Uh, and C Sharp in general, I don't see a lot of people doing that in C Sharp. I think it's more common in other languages. Um, but uh, if somebody has a library that they've used that they like that enforces post conditions, um, I would be interested in seeing it. I know you can use uh, access oriented programming to do some of that uh, using like post sharp and, and you know, access oriented programming or AOP uh, mm -hmm. techniques can, can help you do that. The, uh, the thing about AOP that I don't like is it tends to make your builds really slow if you're using like IL weaving and, and other techniques like that. Um, and I've found that using decorators is, is a much more flexible uh, approach most of the time. So if I did have something where, you know, hey, every time I, I run these methods, I want to verify that the, this log statement was made or, or that I've got uh, some, some audit trail that I can check, right? Well, I could just wrap that in a decorator that enforces the, the auditing um, and now I've got a pre-operation and a post-operation. Not really a check in that case, but it's some logic that has to run every time before and after a method. Um, and that, that might be how I would approach it. it but it, I'd really have to know more about what the requirement was, what the behavior was they were seeking. All right. Uh, and I think that's all we have at the moment. Cool. All right. Just chatter. So go ahead. All right, so let's let's wrap up, you know, with this diagram here, and and kind of see where everything goes. So shared kernel, uh, if you don't know this this little blue rounded corner square thing with white circles in it, that's that's NuGet, um, and so the shared kernel should be a NuGet package that you depend on. Your core uh, library, your core project will depend on it. Your web and infrastructure projects both depend on core. Uh, and then this is, like I said, very testable. Uh, and so the biggest thing you're going to do is test the core. And you're going to be able to write actual unit tests for core. Um, so those are going to be here. Then your your functional tests, which is what I call the integration tests that, that execute the, the web app, um, would, would all hit the web app. And then your other integration tests would be on infrastructure. And so the whole thing kind of looks like this. Now you'll notice I threw in this kind of light gray arrow from web to infrastructure. One of the rules of clean architecture is you want to minimize any kind of direct access from web to infrastructure. You usually need a reference to it because in your composition root, which is the part of your application where all your interfaces get wired up to an implementation for that run, um, you need to access the implementations, right? That's just how it works. So in typical ASP.NET Core, that would happen inside startup configure services, or in .NET 6, where they've done away with startup, it would just happen somewhere in program.cs, right? But when you're starting up your app and you wire up your services, that's, that's where that would need these references to infrastructure. But that's the only place you should have it, right? And so if you have problems with your team, kind of you know going Rambo and just deciding that they're going to new up stuff from infrastructure whenever they feel like it, you could actually uh, not have a project reference to infrastructure and instead copy the DLLs from here into the bin folder of web and then inside program.cs just use assembly to load that, that DLL and then wire everything up from there. 
um, and it, it'll still work just fine. Uh, it's it's not quite as convenient, um, but if you want to really force developers into the pit of success and make it so the only way somebody's going to directly new something up from in infrastructure is if they add in that project reference, and you'll see that in a pull request. Um, now, now you've got a way of enforcing that. Um, so the only place in web should be that, that DI project uh, as far as direct access to infrastructure. Okay. Now let's look at that, how this looks like in your solution. Your folder structure might look something like this. You have core, infrastructure, web, and then you have different different tests that, that hit those. Um, almost ready to look at some code and answer more questions about these different patterns. Uh, let me let me just cover one last thing, which is the different ways that we typically implement uh, actions, uh, whether it's for, for views or, or for APIs. I, I see most developers these days are writing APIs in, in core. Um, not a whole lot of web forms happening in core for obvious reasons, um, but also you know razor pages and views uh, are just not as popular as they were. So most most folks are writing API endpoints uh, with some kind of uh, Angular or React or Blazor or some type of client calling them. Okay, so when you're thinking about how to write these these actions, um, you've got this typical workflow that happens in every action generally. Um, you have to accept whatever the type is that's coming in. Um, you, usually you've got some model binding going on for you that the framework is providing. Um, then you've got to perform any validation with that. Uh, ideally, this is using built-in stuff where you can just you add some annotations to a DTO uh, and get that for free, or you write some you know custom filter uh, that's doing it or some custom model binder or, or validator for you. Then you do the thing that you're actually wanting to do. Right? So all that other stuff is just plumbing to get to the point where you can do the work. Uh, and then you need to create some kind of response, uh, you know, serialize whatever your data is into the type that you're expecting to return back, uh, and then return that uh, using whatever appropriate result type, uh, whether it's an OK or a view or a page or maybe it's not found or bad request or whatever. Um, and so that's generally what you have to do. And, and the less repetitive code you can get in there, the better. So one, two, four, and five, if you can make those all be cross-cutting concerns that you don't have to write any code for inside of each action, you're going to dramatically reduce how much code you have to write and maintain. Uh, so let's look at some options for how we would do this using clean architecture. Um, the first one is that you would just use a repository and entities. Uh, and so doing the work involves going and getting an entity, calling some method on it or setting some properties on it, and then saving that, that entity back to the repository. This is really good for simple stuff. It's great for CRUD, where you're just doing create, read, update, delete, and your API is just you know sort of an interface to your data. Um, it does require some mapping between your web models uh, and the domain model. Uh, usually, this happens inside the controller. Um, and it might look something like this. This one doesn't show the mapping. Um, mainly because it's it's only using an integer as the input uh, and it's not returning anything, it's just returning okay. Um, but but if there were some mapping, it would happen in here too. Um, and so your, your code is not huge by any means, um, but it's basically just saying, go get this item, mark it complete, you know, return it. Now, one thing that you might see that it's not doing is handling if that item's not found, right? And so it's very, very common in code like this to say, well, if item is null, return not found. Um, and, and have that logic be in just about every single endpoint that is relying on this item ID. Um, that's the kind of thing that you can replace with a filter that does that check instead of doing it inside of every action. So that's why I'm not showing it here is because I would generally put that in a filter if I can. Okay, another option is to use an application service. Now an application service, basically the goal of that is to reduce how low level the code is inside your controller and instead work at a slightly higher level of abstraction where you don't necessarily know about low level data access patterns like repositories, you know about this service that does something. And usually that service is gonna have a one for one uh, method that you call for this endpoint. Uh, and so it might look something like this. Uh, well, here, here's where it's better for, for more complex things. Um, it becomes responsible for doing the mapping uh, and it lets your controller stay lighter weight. So it would look like this, right? I've got a mark complete endpoint. That mark complete endpoint calls a service and that service's method is called mark complete, right? Just because that would make sense. Um, it's really nice if you can keep that consistency inside the, the names there. Um, and so now your uh, controller is even simpler. Um, and it, it doesn't have to do the mapping, if that were there. Uh, it doesn't have to do the repository calls, et cetera. 
All right. So option three is you use a command uh, and some tool like Mediator to, to handle this. And so where you might have had a whole lot of different methods that all kind of look like this, but they all use different services with different ways of working. And, and every single one was a, a little bit of its own beautiful snowflake that you had to touch and change and modify. When you get to the Mediator point, it's a way to make it so every one of your actions looks the same. Uh, and so it looks something like this, where you just create a command, you call mediator.send, maybe it returns a result, maybe it doesn't, and then you return you know, whatever that result is back. In this case, we just return OK. Um, now, this one still is a little bit unique because I got to create that that command every time, right? That's that's not cool. That's that's like this boilerplate repetitive code I've got to do every single time. Wouldn't it be great if there were a way like, oh, wait, there is. There's model binding, right? We can just model bind directly to the command um, and then just send it, right? And now literally every action could just be, hey, I'm just sending the command um, in, in that case. Now, you can even take this a step further, which I have, uh, by, by creating all of your controllers so they only have one action, and that action is the handler, um, and that's called uh, the API endpoints project that I have. Um, and you can also use, there's, there's another flavor of that called fast endpoints um, that actually uses the new uh, syntax, the minimal API syntax in ASP.NET 6, ASP.NET Core 6. Um, so you could use that one as well. Okay, but I just want to show you, um, there's different ways that you can organize the controller level, um, if you're using controllers, to, to make it so that you don't have as much duplicate code, to take cross-cutting concerns and, and get rid of them. Um, even getting rid of the, the commands inside of uh, how you send the mediator by just pulling those in from model binding. Um, the, the less code you can have in your controller, the better, because you know it's really hard to test controllers. It's hard to unit test them. Um, you can certainly test them with functional tests, and I do, uh, but I don't want to have to write uh, individual tests for a lot of hairy logic in the controller itself. It's much easier to do that with unit tests, and it's much easier to write unit tests in my core project than it is inside my web project. Um, and so that's why I can do something like you see on the screen here and make it so there's very, very little code in the controller, which means there's not much that can go wrong. Right? What do I need to test here? There's nothing here to test. Right? It just does one call to mediator and returns OK. Like the test would be would be useless. Right? A, a unit test, right? a functional test we'll, we'll still use. OK. Um, let me stop again for a couple questions, if any are there. Uh, let's see. I looked away for a moment. There was a lot of discussion about um, a couple of your previous slides. I don't think there was a question per se. Um, cool. Yep, that looks good. I see somebody's a fan of API endpoints. We'll look at that okay. in a sec. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't let your developers just new up things from projects that they shouldn't be. That's that's the what I was trying to prevent. Okay, so let's look at a couple samples here. So the first sample is eShop on Web. Uh, eShop on Web is a reference architecture from Microsoft. It's open source. I'm one of the primary maintainers uh, of it. Uh, and it goes along with that ebook that I mentioned at the start of the presentation, which you'll find a link to in the README. This is a, an actual sample app. You can pull it down and run it yourself. It will look uh, surprisingly like this, which is the, the app running on, on my machine here. Uh, and if you actually run the application, it will look like this which is an online store. Uh, and so when, when you pull this down and run it yourself, it basically is a full-fledged sample app that, that shows how to make a, you know, a stupid, simple uh, e-commerce e application where uh, you've got this list of products. Uh, you can filter what products you're looking for. Like I only want Azure t-shirts if there are any, uh, and there, there aren't any. Uh, but I could say, well, I, I do want that .NET coffee mug, and there is one, right? Or you can just say, hey, let's just let's do all of them. Uh, all and here. Okay, now one quick thing to notice on this, which we're going to see in the code in a second, uh, is how, how all this data access works, right? Um, it's pretty simple. It's just selecting from a catalog, but it's also using paging, uh, which again, it's not rocket science these days, but that's it's a built-in feature that you can see. Um, and it knows how many products there are total. And that'll be important in just a second. Now, if you do add stuff to the cart, you know, this stuff works like you would expect. You can increment your quantity and update it. You can check out. It'll ask you to log in. Uh, we can log in as the admin user or as a demo user. If you log in as the admin user, you'll get access to a Blazor WebAssembly uh, backend that lets you manage the products. Uh, that's all built into this too. So if you want to see how to do that, all the code is out there. Um, so we'll just log in as admin. We still have these two items in our cart. We'll go ahead and pay. 
Look at that. Our credit card worked magically. Uh, there's, there's not actually payment processing. Um, you can go see your orders. You know, here's this order. We can look at the detail. There's the thing um, that I bought previously. And um, there we go. So Yeah, all right, that's what I ordered. I was thinking like, wait, I thought I bought the mug, but no, I bought this thing. All right, good. I was like, did I just find a bug? That's word there for a sec. Okay, so now let's look at the code. So inside the code for eShop on web, if we close all the things and we look in the source folder, you're gonna see there's a few more than three projects. Now, when this, when this thing was first started, uh, it just had web, infrastructure, and core, right? But when we added Blazor, uh, a couple of years ago for the WebAssembly bits, um, we added a Blazor shared project, which has the, the DTOs and other, other types that are shared between the client and the server. Um, there's also the, the Blazor project itself, which is this one here. Uh, so that added two more. And then it, it seemed worthwhile to make the API endpoints separate as well. So I took the APIs that the Blazor client leverages and I put them in a separate API project. Um, one of the things that let us do also is, is use endpoints uh, as a different way of showing how to structure those APIs instead of using controllers. Uh, and so you can see all, all that in there. Now, if we look at the web project and we see, well, what happens on that home page? Uh, we can look at the pages. If you haven't used Razor pages um, and maybe you thought they were icky because they're kind of like web forms, they're not. They're they're controllers that are just you know using the page uh, object structure, but they basically operate just like an MVC controller does. Um, I love them because they put everything in the same place, so I don't have to go into the controllers folder and then the view models folder and then the you know views folder. Right, I can just go into the pages folder and if I want to see what goes on with index, here's my view right here, and then here's my action right here, like. They're, they're together. They're like literally coupled together in the UI. Um, and so I don't have to go spelunking around in the solution structure trying to find all the types. They're all right here. All right, this is the, the, the view model. This is the action. And, and the, the view is the page CSHTML. OK. So when you load the page, here's what you what you get. With this on get uh, just sets the catalog model. That's the, the view model that's being used. Um, and it's using this catalog view model service to get the catalog items, and it's going to be based on what page you're on and what filters you're applying. Um, now, this is using a, a service that lives in the web project. So if we look in the services folder, you'll see there is a catalog item view model service. Uh, that's not the right one. Catalog view model service. And it basically goes and stitches together all the data needed for that page, right? So um, zoom in a bit to the solution explorer is not clear. Oh, I apologize for that. Let me see if I can. Uh, let me run Zoom it. That'll do it. I don't have Zoom it running. Uh, let's see. One second. Windows Key Plus also works because you'll get magnifier. Trying that. All right. We'll there do you go. That's faster. And then Windows Key Escape to get out of it. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't done that in a while. All right, so here, here's where we are. So this was in pages. Here's that index CSHTML. Um, and then in services, here's that catalog view model service. All right, and there's escape. I haven't had to zoom in a while because uh, I, I don't have people at the back of the room that can't see. So I'm used to you know everybody being able to see it t uh, 12 inches from their face. All right. So here's here's that method, right? So that method is kind of kind of big. It's doing a lot of stuff, and that would have been inside of a controller action or a razor page, um, but we pulled it into a service so that that page could be simpler. Uh, and then this now becomes much more easily tested because it's not relying on any of the web stuff, right? It's independent. Now inside of here, I want to point out that the the query logic is not in here. Right, so instead, there's these two specifications that are doing all the work for the query logic. The first one uh, just includes the brand and the type that they chose, and then the second one is able to get just the the page of results that they're interested in. Um, and so one of those is used here to get a list of things to show, and one of them is used here to get the total items so that we can display the total uh, as part of that paging view. The other thing that you can do because this is um, you know, using a, this common service and this, this interface is we can add caching to this, but I don't have to make this already long method any longer, right? I consider any method that's so long that I have to scroll to see it as, as being too long. Uh, and this one just barely fits at a reasonable font. Um, and so, you know, when I want to add caching, I don't want to add to this 
uh, method that's already doing too much, I can put it in its own class that's basically a decorator. Uh, and then here's the code that does the caching. And so this is following single responsibility principle, and it can be added uh, in the in the startup in the composition root for this app. So I could do something like you know turn on caching by by adding this decorator, uh, and then turn it off by by just configuring something inside startup. And I could load test it and say, well, does caching make a difference to performance? How much of a difference does it make? What does it do to my database load? Yada yada yada. Right? It makes it really easy for me to do experiments uh, and see how how these different techniques impact the the real performance of the application. Okay, um, so let's look at those specifications real quick. So in application core, what goes in here? Well, this is all the stuff that's not related to infrastructure. And so we've got our entities, they're organized into aggregates. So for instance, a basket includes a basket and a basket item. Um, that's an aggregate because they get stored and retrieved from the database as a unit. Um, inside of here, we have some custom exceptions like basket not found. Um, we have uh, all the interfaces that we're using. There's some services in here for, for dealing with things. Uh, and there's the specifications. So let me uh, zoom in on that again, since I know people will want to see that. Uh, here's, here's the whole thing, right? I'll scroll up a little bit. So there's, there's the entities and the aggregates, um, exceptions, interfaces, services, and specifications. OK? I keep forgetting I have to zoom, sorry. OK. Um, now let's look at the one that was used on the homepage. So back here, we were saying there is a catalog filter specification and a paginated one. Um, and so let's look at what that looks like. So the catalog filter specification is right here. Uh, and it is very, very simple. It is just using a link expression, the same link expression that you would send to Entity Framework or, or use with iQueryable or whatever. Um, but instead, we're putting it inside a specification so that it's reusable, so that it's testable, so that it's not you know, mucking up our code everywhere else. Um, it's, it's only in one place, and, and it has a name that's really obvious what it is. It's the, you know, the catalog filter. Uh, and so it's, it's very clear what this thing is doing. Uh, the paginated one is here as well. It's slightly more complicated, but but not by much. It just does the paging with a skip and a take, uh, and it has the the where logic and and some default information um, to pull in the, the the items, right? And so all that logic is again in here instead of adding extra junk to our our actions in our API endpoints or in our pages or views, um, and so that's that's the the specification. Um, this uh, this one doesn't have any domain events, so I'll show you those in a second. But this is the like I said, reference architecture uh, and sample. The the other code that I want to show you here is uh, my clean architecture template. And so the clean architecture template is right here. Is this it? Yeah. Uh, and and so it's not a sample application. Um, it is meant to be just a template. Uh, and so if we go to it on GitHub, let's go here and here. This is it running, actually. But then the uh, the GitHub project is here. We'll open that. Uh, and you can actually run this as a template using .NET New, uh, which, which I can show you real quick. So let me uh, bring up PowerShell and go to a scratch folder. And... Did it, did it finally finish? There we go. It was being really slow for some reason. So down here, if you scroll a little bit, you'll see that this template is available on NuGet, and you can install it using this code right here. So we'll copy that, and we'll bring PowerShell up here, and just paste this in. And I've already installed it, so this is really fast, um, or it should be really fast. It's already installed. It's going to be replaced with version dot. Well, that doesn't sound good. Six six oh ten. The one that I already had is a uninstalled and then reinstalled. Okay, I guess if you need to do that, that's fine. All right. So then, then what? Well, now you come over here and you just run this one. So we'll just copy that. And I just want to show you this really does work. So we'll paste this in here and we'll call this uh, Hampton Road dot user group. And then thing that this is nice uh, as as opposed to just like cloning or forking my repo or, or downloading a zip file um, is that now when when this is in there, let me go to CD ham there and LS and that there, uh, all the namespaces and files and everything are, are set correctly. Um, and so as soon as this opens up, you'll see it's the solution has got the right name, the projects all have the right name, the uh, types in here 
all have the right namespaces. Namespaces are even using uh, this semicolon uh, file scope namespace feature, which I love. Um, I wish we'd had that forever ago. Uh, and that's a that's a new C sharp whatever latest version ten I guess feature. Um, but but it's really nice. It makes it so you don't have extra indents on all your classes. But all this stuff is set for you by the template. Okay, so then the uh, Domain events are the thing I really want to show you in here. So this is not a full-fledged sample app. Like I said, this is it. Uh, where's the code? This is it running right here. And the main thing that you would look at here is the the Swagger API docs. This is live um, with that app. Or you can look at these Razor pages. That one apparently didn't work. Somehow SQLite's not working locally, um, which means these probably won't work either. I'm not sure what's going on there, but that's all right. We don't need it to work for me to show you the code. Um, and since it's not a sample app, it doesn't really like do a whole lot. Uh, it just has a few little things in here just to kind of show you how some of the patterns work. Uh, and then you just delete that stuff because you won't need it when, once, you're, once you get going. Um, it does have a shared kernel project. The thing you would do with this is create a new repo, copy this into it, publish it to your internal NuGet feed, and get rid of this project from, from this solution. Right? Your shared kernel should never be in the solution um, that you're working on. It's, it's just provided here so that you know what to put in it. Uh, and so it has all the shared you know, base classes and things that you would, that you would expect to, to have. Um, the domain events I want to mention real quick. So the, the sample code in here is this, is this notion of a project. Right? And a project. Uh, is, is like you know some project you've got around the house or at work that you're trying to get done. And a project is composed of a number of to-do items or tasks, if you will. Uh, and so there's this list of to-do items here that the project uh, consists of. And then you might do things with the project, like you might add items to the project or you might uh, mark tasks as being complete. Um, and when you do those things, there might be events that, that are triggered that result in downstream effects occurring. So whenever you add an item, it adds the item after it verifies that it's not null, uh, and then it raises this event. Um, if you look at an item itself, um, instead of letting someone just set the is done property, uh, we have extra behavior that we might want to have triggered when that occurs. Uh, and so we're making it so you have to call the mark complete method. This is you know following domain driven design. So we're we're encapsulating our internal state. We're exposing the operations that are allowed through well named methods. Um, and then in here. Uh, it's only going to mark it as done if it's not already done. Um, and then it's going to add this to do item completed event. So, so what does that do for us? Well, let's say we have a requirement that says we need to send somebody an email whenever a task is complete. Okay, well, we could put the email logic right here, right? We could say, okay, is done is true right here, uh, send an email. Okay, but how are we going to do that? Right, we're in the middle of our core project in our domain model. We don't have access to email sending right here. So one way we could do it is with some static utility method that would do it. Um, but that would tightly couple us to sending emails. It would make it so we couldn't test this method without having some way to actually send emails. And that's a nightmare. Um, we could pass in here like you know, email sender sender uh, or something like that. And if we use an actual class for this, like this is the uh, send grid email sender or the SMTP email sender. Like now we're tightly coupled to an implementation, so we don't want that. Um, I know, let's use an interface. We could use iEmail sender. All right, this is not the worst thing, but I mentioned earlier why I'm not a big fan of passing dependencies in through methods. Sometimes it's the only way you can go, especially in your entities, um, but it, it's still not my preferred approach. Uh, my preferred approach for this type of thing is, is to listen to the requirement. And the listen to the requirement, when they say it, they'll say, when somebody marks an item complete, then I want to send an email. And whenever you hear that, that when this, then that, that's a perfect candidate usually for domain events. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll just add this domain event and then we'll go implement that uh, with a handler. So over here, there's a, a handler for item completed. And so when the to do item completed event happens, then we send an email, right? And the email sender gets injected in here just fine, right? It does not complicate my entity at all. Uh, and it makes it so that I can add more of those things, right? If I have a bunch of stuff that should happen when, when something is completed, I can put them all in different handlers and each one is gonna be super simple, right? There's no if logic here, there's no complexity, there's nothing in there at all. Uh, it doesn't have to worry about interacting with all the other business rules because um, each one of those can be in their own separate simple handler. 
Um, and so the way this works is it's all wired up inside of infrastructure, uh, inside the DB context. Uh, and so when we save changes, we save the changes. And if that fails, it's going to throw an exception on this line, right? So if it succeeds, then we're going to use mediator to fire off these events. And basically, it just loops over all the domain events that it finds, uh, and it publishes them. Um, and, and that's how this works. Uh, so what this does is it makes sure that the state was saved in the database before we do stuff like send emails, because we don't want to have something where like the user places an order, and we say, thanks for your order, and we send them an email that says, here's your order, and then we try to save it, and it doesn't save. Right, because now we have no record that they placed an order. Right, it's not in our database. It didn't happen, um, but the users got an email that that says they did. Right, that's not a good state to be in. So we only do these events after we we save changes. These are post persistence events, um, but then it lets us have all that decoupling, better testability, etc., uh, because of the way this is set up. <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm looking at uh, a lot of discussion in the chat. Not sure if there's any questions right now, but uh, I'll, I'll let Kevin tell me. Um, how are we doing on time? I think I've covered uh, most of the stuff I want to cover. I think so you're fine on time. Actually, there was a question from a couple topics back that I didn't see and uh, okay. would like to revisit. Um, it was, uh, what are Steve's thoughts on using packages instead of DLLs in the case of developers misusing the infrastructure project? Most of the time, I don't do the DLL copying trick. Like, it's usually, I, I trust the developers that are on the team, so I just use project references. Um, but if you really did need that level of control, then it's it's really easy to go into you know infrastructure uh, and and go to properties and and have a post build action uh, that would that would do this right. So like post build right here, copy to you know dot dot whack uh, you know web whack bin or whatever right and so this is what this is what i've done yeah um now you could say that every time we build we're going to publish this as a package as another nuget package um but then that means you're just going to have all kinds of nuget packages and i i wouldn't recommend that like that's just going to make it more difficult for you to to you know work with the the system i think it's going to cause a lot of friction um so i i have not tried that and and i don't think it would end well if i did um, but if someone else is having success and wants to tell me why it's the best thing since sliced bread, I'll definitely listen uh, and maybe update my my opinion. Let's see. Other than that, uh, there's some discussion about shared kernels. Um, other than that, just regular chatter. No, not necessarily questions. If anybody wants to say, hey, Steve, I want to see this uh, in here. And uh, well, I guess the other thing I'll show you is functional tests real quick. So when I'm talking about how I write tests for these APIs, um, you know, like a, a list projects test would look something like this. And so I, I have another NuGet package. I have a couple of NuGet packages. I have a problem. Um, but I have a NuGet package called our Dallas HP client test extensions. And it has things like this, get and deserialize. Because I got tired of writing the same four lines of code every time to say, go get me this response, and then go get the model, and then deserialize it to this, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so here is the thing that I'm getting. That's the, uh, the path. Um, and this is the thing I'm deserializing it into. And then this is just a one-liner uh, that I can just do to get the result. And then you know do my assertions, um, and so that's that's how easy your your tests for your APIs should be. Um, get by ID is is similar. Uh, you know, here's my my two tests for that. Um, I noticed that the uh, SQLite wasn't working, but I think my test should still work. Let's find out. No, oh, those all pass. They run so fast you can't even tell. Uh, let's run all of them. That's not as fast. If you ever watch my Pluralsight courses, whenever I run a test, I always edit out of all this stuff. So it's like, you know, they're always super fast in pre-recorded Pluralsight. But live, sometimes they take time. This thing lies. Look at this. 1.7 seconds, 600 milliseconds, 84 milliseconds. Like, we all sat here and watched this thing spin for 10 seconds. I don't know what it was doing. The build had already succeeded. So I don't know what they were doing. Um, but okay, so yeah, the functional tests are the slowest, as you would expect, because they're they're doing the most um, at 1.7 seconds. That's most of that startup time. 
Um, and then I've got some integration tests to just verify that, uh, you know, the repositories do what they're supposed to do. And then, you know, a lot of unit tests that verify the logic. And again, this is a solution template, not a full-fledged sample app. Um, but here is code that when you when you install this template, which you just watched me do, um, uh, that's why I'm in the wrong one, because this is the one that I just did for this. All right, so here's the one that I just did. That's the new the new template version. The other one was the, the actual source of clean architecture. Um, so here, you just watched me do this one. Uh, then you get all these tests, and you kind of have a sample to work from for how those tests should work. All right. Uh, if you're not doing tests and if you're not testing your APIs using the, the stuff that's in ASP.NET Core, you really should be because it's so easy. Um, I see someone mentioning Respawn. Respawn's a good tool uh, for, for using a DB. It'll still be order of magnitude slower than, than unit tests, but it does let you do closer integration testing um, if you want. That was the general question above it uh, was, do you have a good example for testing against databases? Yeah, there's some of that in here. Um, so, so the, uh, you know, this, where, where's my test down here, uh, in the functional tests, right? The, the main thing that makes these things work is this custom web application factory. Uh, and so there's, there's a few, uh, things you can do in here. Um, I'm seeding the database with this test data before every test. Uh, and so this, this create host creates a new instance of the ASP.NET Core application before every test. Right, and so this runs n times, where n is how many tests I have. Um, and then in here, uh, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, because this is just a sample, it's just using uh, whatever whatever database provider is, is configured in, uh, in the main application, I think. Um, I haven't looked at this one in a while. But a lot of the times you can use the in-memory provider, uh, or you can use SQLite. Uh, as well, and and there's there's lots of resources online that show how to how to set it up however you like it. Uh, if you want to use a real database, if you want to use SQL Express or, or even a real SQL Server, you certainly can. Um, you just wire it up here, uh, and and whatever you put in here with these services is is going to. Um, actually, sorry, it's down here. Down here, whatever you do in this configure web host um, is going to adjust how it works in in this case. So there's my in-memory database I was looking for. Um, and so this one is using the ASP.NET Core, I'm sorry, the Entity Framework Core in memory uh, data store for the tests. Um, but like I said, you could modify this to use um, SQLite or, or something else if you wanted to. Okay. Uh, all right, let me jump back to slides where I think I have like a couple last things. There's the clean architecture URL. Here's the template that I talked about. Um, let's talk about API endpoints real quick and then we'll, we'll be done. So code walkthrough, resources, blah, blah, blah. Um, you guys don't care about that. So I'm going to go to the API endpoints. Let's start with the, the repo real quick. If you haven't heard of it, uh, it is not linked from there. But we'll go here and go to our Dallas. And it's on my home page, API endpoints. It's got 2,000 stars. That's crazy. Um, and so in here, basically, it has the, the docs and everything you would expect. Um, we're up to version 3.x. You can get it from NuGet, which is, or sorry, on version 4.x. My bad. Um, do I need to update the docs? I don't know if I need to update the docs. But uh, here it is on NuGet. For some reason on my machine, all my pages take like two seconds before they load. I haven't figured out what it's doing. Maybe it's a Chrome thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's doing all right. It's got some downloads. Uh, it's still nowhere close to like guard clauses, but it's it's a decent little package. And here's here's what it does for you. So um, let me go open it in Visual Studio API endpoints. I might already have this open, but we'll just open another instance. That's why I have lots of RAM. And uh, we'll look at the sample. So the sample endpoint app uh, is here, and instead of having controllers. You have endpoints. So we'll just window zoom in here. All right. And so we have these author endpoints. And what you can do with an author is you can create, delete, get uh, one of them, get a list, uh, update them, or even list them as a, with a JSON file. I forget what that is. Uh, I think I think somebody had a question about how to do file access with endpoints. So I added that just to, to show it. Um, but this is the, the endpoint, right? What you would normally have in a controller as an action, or if you're using minimal APIs as just some Lambda function somewhere, you've got an actual class, you know, the C-sharp way of doing things um, that represents that, that endpoint. Uh, and when you want to work with that endpoint, you have 
a model for what is its input or its command, uh, what, what does someone send with it, and what is the result or the response? What do you get back from this endpoint? And just like with Razor Pages, they're, they're right here. They're chained to it. Uh, and so you don't have to go hunting around to find the things. They're, they're literally right with it. Um, and so when you double click on this and get out of Zoom, um, here's basically what it looks like. Every endpoint has a signature like this, where it inherits from a base uh, endpoint base, and it has uh, a fluent generic interface, right? So it kind of helps you out with, with how to write this, where you can say dot with request or without request and say, well, you know, let's, let's say I just want to list all the customers or list all the authors uh, and I don't have a parameter, right? Well, then I could just say, well, I don't have a request. Okay, that's fine. Um, what's my result? Well, I could say with, and I've got a few different types of results. Um, you know, if you're doing a delete, maybe you don't have a result, right? So you could say without result, right? It's, it'd be pretty weird to have an endpoint that had no, no input and no output, but you could, you could do it. Maybe something like reset database or something. Um, but yeah, you could, you can give it an action result or a result, uh, either one, um, a result would be uh, you know, like a particular, you know, DTO or something like a create author command or, or something like that. Um, but it kind of helps you drive that right here. Um, and then what those generic types are used for is this handle async method. So when you say I'm, I'm returning a, an action result as my result, that means this is going to be a task of action result. And when I say my request is a create, create author command, that's what comes in here as, as the request. Okay, so then uh, all you have to do is implement the code right here. Right, so that's that's your whole endpoint. Now, if you're using Mediator to achieve this now, what you have is a whole bunch of useless skeletons of controllers that all just delegate to Mediator.send, and then you have a whole folder full of handlers that do this, right? And so all this does is it gets rid of the middleman, right? You don't need Mediator for that. This this just becomes your handler, right? Every handler gets replaced with an endpoint, and every endpoint is basically taking in a command and returning a result, just like your Mediator handlers are. Um, so it's, if you're using Mediator for other stuff, which is definitely great for a lot of things, then by all means, keep Mediator. It's a great tool. I use it a lot. But if the only thing you're using Mediator for is to make it so your controllers can become these vestigial structures that just call out to handlers, then ditch that and just use these endpoints instead. It's, it's a better pattern, in my opinion. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. Like, if you look at the code itself, it's, it's really trivial. So uh, the source for um, the API endpoints, if I can even find it, uh, da, 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 there it is, uh, is is right here, um, and it's you know endpoint base inherits from controller base, and then the fluent generics you know just is a little bit of, of extra code here. Um, I didn't invent this pattern; somebody else did. Uh, and so if you Google for fluent generics, you'll find it. Uh, I think I give them credit in the uh, um, README file as well. But it's it's a really nice way to handle something that has generic inputs and outputs um, like this. Uh, and then there's some extension methods. Oh, the other thing that this does for you. No, sorry, I'm thinking of a different project. Different project. Never mind. Um, yeah, that's it. That's what API endpoints does. Um, and then the other one I mentioned, which I, I've been looking at, it's 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 a competitor of mine, uh, essentially. But it's it's a, a really nice site. It's got great documentation here. These fast endpoints, um, and it does essentially the same thing um, as as my tool does. Uh, you can see they use a similar structure, like endpoint of my request. Um, but they're they're claiming that because they're using the the new minimal APIs, which it says in here somewhere probably, um, that it's it's a little bit faster, right? And so if performance is super important to you, which I mean it should be at least a little bit important to you, um, then you might want to check this one out too. Uh, and when I get around to it, I have a lot of stuff going on, so it may be a little bit. Um, I may try and, and adopt some of the same ideas from from here, or at least you know, like them, adopt the minimal API stuff uh, into my version as well. Right now, mine's all based on the controller stuff. Um, the reason why it's good that that it, my API endpoints is all based on controllers is that anything that works with controllers works with this. So like all the model binding and model validation and filters and everything else, all that stuff works. Whereas with minimal API, some of that stuff's not baked yet. Um, wait, wait for ASP.NET Core 7 before we get some of those features. Um, and so we, all those features are there already in this one. And so if you've got stuff that's already in controllers, you're using the controller ecosystem, if you will, um, you can carry all that over into these endpoints. Um, and all you get is a better way to organize your code. All right, that is pretty much what I've got, except for any questions people have. All right, friends, this is your last chance. Uh, there will be a recording available to this, um, so don't worry about that. 
A lot of folks working late tonight. Can I get a recording? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll take care of that. Covered that. In memory, DB is cheating. I mean, yeah, <laughs> but it works hey, for it works work. for samples and demos. It it doesn't always work too well with real code, obviously. But um, you know, if you can use it, it's it's not a bad choice. Um, the other thing to think about when you're doing those functional tests with the uh, uh, custom web application factory, you don't have to use the same custom web application factory for every test, right? So maybe you have some tests that you could use in memory for and other ones that you need to use a real database for. Make two factories, right? That's totally okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. All righty. Well, thank you everyone we'll give it another minute here uh thank you steve for our hanging out with us uh always appreciate uh learning from you um always pick up a, a tidbit here and there so i think everyone else out there in chat will agree um yes we will have the video on demand available um i also have a copy of this on uh youtube um if that's okay steve so people can yeah, watch yeah, that's it totally fine. um so we'll make sure make sure you all have access to it. Um, all right. Also, if you're coming to Stir Trek in Ohio next month, come say hi. And if you're not coming to Stir Trek, tickets are still on sale. Usually we sell out like in five minutes, but this year, you know, we're still coming out of COVID. There's still some tickets left. So if you want to come to a great conference, see a Marvel movie, Columbus, Ohio, May seventh. Come check it out. Come say hi. All right, YouTube. Oh, sorry about that. Let me drop uh, a YouTube link. You've got, yeah, I think they want your YouTube. Um, so it'll be this, uh, this talk in particular will be up there. My YouTube is shockingly our Dallas. Our Dallas. <laughs> oh, and Drew's back with us. Hey, Drew. Hey, Drew. Great talk. Lots of good information there. All right, friends. Well, uh, let's see. We do have some speakers lined up. So next month we have Mr. Shahed Chahuri. Um, he is going to be talking about Azure Machine Learning uh, for friends interested. And also in, was it June? Oh, my gosh. We're almost halfway through the year. Uh, Mr. David Giard is going to be joining us to talk about code reviews. Uh, that should be a fun talk. All right. Well, chat has gone silent for me. So that means uh, we're at a good wrapping up point. Um, Steve, thank you so much again for hanging out with us. Uh, Drew, thank you for being there. Uh, thank you everyone in chat, uh, whether you're on YouTube, Twitch, or LinkedIn uh, for hanging out with us. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you all next month. Take care. Bye, everybody.